So with OpenStack, we now have 25 million cores in production. We even have a tiny little prop here just to remind you. So that's up from 15 million cores only a year ago. So 66% growth in a year. That's, that's crazy um, to see that. And I think just the demand for infrastructure is off the charts and people are turning to OpenStack for that, which is one of the keys in the open infrastructure landscape. And another example of that, if you look at the public clouds, there are over 175 data centers that are powered by OpenStack for public clouds. We even have another prop. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is the beauty of having a set. Uh, so we have this map back here and there's a pin for every single location in the world where we have public cloud, so incredible footprint there. Yeah, and in fact, if you look at the growth, there's of course lots of new users, but also a lot of our existing users just keep growing their footprint. In fact, we now have seven companies that are running over 1 million cores each in their data centers, so much so that I think we may even have to create a whole new category, a whole new award for these mm. million core people. Maybe we'll hear more about that later. Um, so I think, you know, when we think about open infra overall and the growth of it, there's so much data to share and actually to deep dive on the user survey. We have data on all of the, of the projects within the Open Infra Foundation. So make sure you, you uh, tune in tomorrow for that. And then I think uh, one of the things that we're also seeing is just a lot of collaboration across the industry, right? So it's, it's not just more projects, but also more companies getting involved. You mentioned that Microsoft's now a platinum member. We have some, several speakers from Microsoft here this week during the show. We also have folks from AWS talking about what they're doing with open search. So we have more collaboration as well. And when you put it all together, we just have more open source and more infrastructure everywhere. More, more, more. That seems <laughs> to be the theme. And, and I think you, know, you mentioned more open source, more infrastructure. Uh, that definitely ties just into the broader trends that we see in the industry overall. Uh, we've talked before about how Digital infrastructure is key to every single business, every single activity, really, that we are doing as humans right now, whether that is retail, finance, science, government, on and on and on. It all depends on having compute storage and networking that's available, um, that's scalable, that we can just depend on for all of these applications. And obviously, you know, we think that it's critical that those capabilities be available through open source technology so that everyone, no matter where they are, uh, can take advantage of these advances and not get left behind or kind of um, get stuck depending on, on only one source for something so critical. And one of the things that we've really noticed is uh, as that growth has just skyrocketed, especially in the last year when so much activity moved online, there have really been some patterns that have emerged. You know, a lot of this software has gotten to the point where it's reliable, it's scalable, people can really depend on it. And as that has happened, we've seen some trends in how people put this technology together. Um, if we look at this user survey that Mark was talking about, uh, we can find some trends within that. And one of the trends that to me really jumps out is that there is a specific way that people are building their infrastructure with open source right now. And they're doing it using three of the four most active open source projects in the world. Three of the top open source projects in the world are actually infrastructure projects. So the first one is Linux. And uh, this year, Linux celebrated 30 years since uh, Linus first kicked off uh, the Linux kernel project. Um, and so for 30 years, Linux has been developing this kernel that can be used in so many different ways to manage a single device. You know, And those devices could be cars and thermostats and TVs, but also millions and millions of servers that are running Linux. And so Linux really fills that need for an open source operating system that can manage a single server, whether that's a virtual server or a physical server. About uh, 11 years ago now, we, uh, we launched the OpenStack project. And the OpenStack project is the standard for open source cloud. Um, and again, it manages a set of physical or virtual servers. Uh, it can provision hardware from bare metal up through um, virtual machines up into, as, as Mark was mentioning earlier, millions and millions of them within a data center and automating all of those workloads. So that's a really core component of managing infrastructure. And in the last um, six years or so, we've really seen Kubernetes emerge as the standard for open source container orchestration. Um, so Kubernetes comes into play 
as we have seen applications be re-architected and be based around microservices, you need something that can handle many, many, many application components that are containerized and then need to be um, replicated and, uh, and managed so that they are resilient and, um, and reliable in, in the uh, case of underlying hardware failures. So you know, when you put these together, you end up with a really rich set of capabilities that gives you the ability to uh, manage not just kind of uh, a monolithic application on a single server or even a horizontally uh, scaled application that might be running across multiple servers, but you can run these microservice applications that are running in, in thousands or even millions of containers at, at a fully distributed scale and, uh, and really, you know, that's the architecture that so many modern apps are built in. So this is such a powerful um, set of tools and what we have seen emerge is that this has become the open infrastructure standard. And uh, you know, I've been calling this Loki for Linux, OpenStack, and Kubernetes infrastructure. Uh, it's, to me, it's reminiscent of when I was first getting into the industry and the LAMP stack emerged, which was Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP as the way that we were building web applications in, in the early 2000s. Um, you know, that was a pattern that emerged naturally from usage and it was something that brought together incredible capabilities from a number of different open source communities, merged them into a standard pattern, and really that is how the dynamic web was built and created and launched and still you know, powers a very large number of, of the web apps out there on the internet. And so I think that when we look at this massive growth that we see, one of the things that has driven it is there is a new open infrastructure standard that has emerged with Linux, OpenStack, and Kubernetes for infrastructure. And that is driving this adoption. It also drives um, kind of the, uh, the time to, uh, to functionality and the, and the effectiveness of teams as they want to be able to move faster, deploy more applications, and scale those. So this to me is, uh, is something that's a really important point um, for our, our kind of open infrastructure movement to see out there in the real world. Yeah, and I think, Jonathan, when you talk about Loki and the Loki stack being a standard for open infra, for open infrastructure, this is not just some you know, thing that we're looking at down the road. This is actually here today. These are uh, things that patterns we determine from talking to real world users, looking at our user survey. So 70% of the users of OpenStack are running Kubernetes. I think everybody's running Linux, right? So most of our users, those 25 million cores, most of those cores are running the Loki stack today. So that Linux, OpenStack, Kubernetes infrastructure, that's what's powering, you know, organizations like CERN and Yahoo, Workday, T-Systems, and Verizon, AT&T. I mean, there's so many companies that are running Loki today, and that includes also companies like China Mobile, China Telecom, Line, Vodafone. I mean, the list goes on and on. And it's just kind of a new way to, to describe it. Um, and of course, I think Loki is a great name. So kudos <laughs> to you for the Loki stack uh, uh, new, new acronym. The world always needs Yeah, we need more acronyms. More. Another thing we need more, more of is, is more acronyms. acronyms. So please well, go on. Well, what I think is also really interesting about this is I mentioned earlier that these are three of the top four most active open source projects. The fourth one is, is Chromium or Chrome OS. Um, which powers the uh, kind of Chromebooks and Chrome browser and, and that, that community. Uh, but the other three in that top four are Linux, OpenStack, and Kubernetes. These are projects that are extremely active. Um, OpenStack just had its 24th release. And as, as I said, you know, we're 11 years on. Linux is 30 years old. Um, so these are very enduring projects that continue to innovate. And what I love about this is thinking about this innovation, not just kind of as each project on its own, but really the combined innovation across the open infrastructure space here. Um, when, you, when you look at those, uh, the kind of the annual contributions that each of these projects are seeing and the, and the changes that are coming into their code base, um, Linux is at around 80,000 changes per year. OpenStack and Kubernetes are both around 35,000 changes a year. You add that up, that's 150,000 changes coming into these communities. That is innovation happening every day on a constant basis, every year, just continuing to, uh, to move us all forward and doing it in a way that is open source. So this is available to everyone around the world. And, uh, and I think that that is, is such a cool <coughs> way to build this technology, to share it, and to see it developed. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, to your point, Jonathan, it is about the combined actions of so many people all over the world. It's multiple communities. 
And it's really about the people, right? We talk about the technology, what it can do, what companies are running it, what, you know, 5G phones, you know, phone calls. Like we can talk about all the use cases. They're super cool, right? But all of this is about people and it's about the people everywhere in the world having the opportunity to contribute, to help uh, decide what's the direction of this technology and where should it go, whether it's the Linux community or Kubernetes or OpenStack or many, many other projects, Ceph, et cetera. I mean, there's so much open source out there. So it's not just about the, the giant projects. There's so many projects out there. And so in, in part, one of the things that we think about is decentralization. This is kind of a hot term these days. But at the, at the end of the day, really, it's the, the underlying concept here is it's not just about one company or one country or one foundation or one project, right, or one community. It's about everybody in the world having an opportunity to both contribute to the software and decide where it goes, but also to be able to run it and, ad and adopt it, whether they're a small company. Like the power of Loki stack is not just for giant companies, right? It's for everybody out there. And we want to make sure everyone understands that they can join us. So please do join. Uh, Openinfo.dev slash join is one way you can get involved, but there are many different ways to get involved with each of these communities. And it's people powered, so it, it's all about all of you showing up and, and participating, and everyone's invited. Yeah, and that reminds me of a, a keynote that you gave a few years back where we, we had a, a giant screen in the, in the Austin Convention Center, and you said, collaborate or die. <laughs> And I think you know that's really what this is all about. Is it's about bringing together, like you said, people from all over the world, from different um, from different countries and companies and communities, to work on on a similar goal. Because what we want is we want this critical technology to be available, not to be um, centrally controlled or uh, or you know um, something that that is unavailable to to anybody who who needs it to kind of keep moving things forward. And that that you know that gets back to your decentralization point.